Hey everyone, it's Manny here. Today, I'm really super pumped. I love microphones, as you probably know, or if you don't know, I love microphones. This is something I actually pursued myself. Um, Warren had some Mojave mics that he was gonna be testing out, and I had heard about this microphone right here. It's a MA37 made by Mojave. Beautiful design. There's little holes which were a vent for the tube inside. This is a tube condenser. But even more important, this is kind of a recreation of a Sony C37. Almost looks just like it. Just to know how heavy duty it is. That is a pretty stealthy looking power supply. My cable output. The microphone, which is really cool with a small screwdriver, you change the capsule directly from cardioid to Omni. The Sony, if you don't know, a Sony C37 is a classic mic from the 50s and 60s and 70s. Really sought after, they're really expensive. A lot of big producers use them. I had a real Sony uh, C37 and honestly, I didn't understand the hype, and I sold it. I didn't, it was really dark, and at that time, I felt like, why would I spend a lot of money for a mic if I'm not going to use it on every session? So when I borrowed this one, and it's not mine, I'm not even, this, I don't own this. Uh, I told Warren, let me try it out, and he was nice enough to leave it with me for about a month. And I've gotten to make maybe four, five, six records using this mic, and I love this mic. It's dark like a U60, uh, this, like a C37, but it accepts EQ way better than my other one. So because this is dark as night sounding, if you put this, I use this on drums for rooms. I've used this for overhead drums. The cymbals do not kill this mic. It just sounds like beautiful big drums and the cymbals are in the second tier behind the drums. I've used this on a lead vocal. I just did a, a song with Hunt Sales and you'll be seeing a video maybe even before this one comes out. And I had Hunt, I used this on Hunt's drums and I used this on Hunt's uh, vocal and I love it. So I can't say enough on how much I dig this mic. So when I did this song, which you're about to hear, uh, from a local Los Angeles band, they were up for um, one mic, one band. So the process was we put down a little bit of a clicks and they put down the parts one at a time over it. I know I could have done one mic and had everybody around it, but I did want to hear what the mic sounded like on individual instruments. The band, I, don't kill me if I'm going to say it wrong, my, I always called them Black Spring. That's because I did their first record, and I always call them Black Spring. But the correct band is El Haido Kuroi. E-L-H-A-R-U-K-U-R-O-I. We're going to get started now. Uh, we use the um, one mic on this whole thing. All right, so let's start with the percussions. And this is the cajon, which is a box. So we're going to start the prof process, and Dominique is going to be laying down the foundation. Uh, Dominique, please let me know what is it you're using, what are you sitting on, and what's going on here? This is a cajon, um, more Peruvian style cajon than Spanish. Uh, I made it, pretty much a box. <laughs> cool. So on, on the Mojave, I'm on the Mojave MA37, I've already adjusted, right there is a small entrance which has a, screw, a flathead screwdriver, and I put it from cardioid to omni. And I want to capture more of the body of, the, of that uh, percussion sound. I didn't adjust anything on the, um, on the power supply, uh, but it's just basically a flat setting. I just want to try to capture as much low end, uh, utilize the tube of the microphone, and I've changed the pattern to Omni, which is more engulfing in a wider, um, a wider field. It will pick up as opposed to cardioid which have been kind of closer to the sound source. So uh, we're going to get started. He'll be hearing a click through his headphone, and that will give him the beat. And since he knows the song so well, 
he'll be laying down the foundation first, almost like if he had drums or a tambourine. This is going to be the anchor for the song. And then as we start to overdub, uh, this will be uh, recording uh, number one of setting up the foundation for the song. Besides the click, that will change in two BPMs from the beginning, which is at 72, and that somewhere around the middle, the BPM will change to 110, but their performance will be uh, played live through both BPMs, and he's going to start it with that. So this is the first thing we recorded, and then we built the song around this. Now that's just the raw file, that's the M37, which sounds great. As we were mixing, they, we, we spoke about maybe adding some reverb and some other things to it. He thought maybe a delay, so, I'm gonna, so I added an analog, one of my favorite delays. And that is, I always use an H delay. I can't tell you anymore that I love it, and it just sounds like music to my ears. So we have an H delay, and then I added a uh, LA-3A, I believe. Yeah, there it is. Just a wave, standard one. And I don't, when you see me adding waves, I have some other plugins that could probably be cooler. I just like the way they sound, and I just kind of go for when I'm mixing what sounds good and I don't worry about a brand and I don't worry about, oh, is it a wave? Is it a universal audio? Is it a sound toys? I just reach for them like tools and whatever I happen to use. So I happen to really think it was cool to use an LA-3A. Now, I will say that of all my buddies that have big studios, and this is probably not a secret to, to most, but they all tell me that the LA-3A is one of the best thing for guitars. And if they have a studio and they have their own rig, that is one of the go-tos that they have. So if you are out there in the world and you see a cheap, which I don't know anymore, an LA-3A, that is considered, to my friends that are pro dudes, one of the greatest uh, compressor limiters. So um, don't be a snob about 1176s or LA-2As and LA-3A, and maybe soon LA-4As are gonna be coming up. So. Plug-in only, I'm using an LA-3A. I added a Neve to it, and I think I added just a hair of low end. I did add a hair of low end. And um, I'm gonna play those together. Now, the reason I used the LA-3 is I, I just wanted to kind of clamp down on them jumping out too much. So then from there, I added a, one of my favorites, a little plate by Soundtoys. Then we wanted a little bit more low into it, and obviously it's a tube mic, and we have it in front of it. It isn't like it's something you can tune. It's only going to give you one thing. I did love the sound. So I added an R bass, which is a plug-in that's kind of an artificial synthesized low end to it. But I use the R bass not necessarily to add the low end. It has a nice way to take a little bit of the edge off the sound, and you can roll in some low end. So it's really beautiful, and I feel like it's more of a musical plug-in than just adding a synthesized low end. So here's with the R bass on. And here's with it off. Just added that little something. So then I added a de-esser. Why would you add a de-esser? I want to still take off a little bit more. And I like using de-essers, not EQs. You can still mess around with the frequencies, but it gives me a little bit more flexibility, and you can almost do it in like small increments, so you're not really getting an EQ and messing with the phase and doing this huge cut or scoop. You're really doing it in really small increments. So I think on this one, I'm cutting a little bit over about 6.5K on it, and uh, so I'm going to add that in.
off, on. Now you're gonna probably go, this is illegal. What's this guy doing? This is called produced like a pro. What are we doing here? I added another delay. What the hell is that guy thinking? And it's on the other side of all the plugins because I thought it sounded cool and I just wanted to blur it even more. So here's the other delay. So that one that I do is definitely, obviously sounds really fast. It's just a real short delay. So I have a long one and then I have a short one and I've added reverb. I'll discuss this later, but for right now, I have a time adjustment that is a delay, but it's really just slipping the file back. It can only go backwards. And I'll tell you once I get through all the tracks why I'm even using that. Uh, but I have a time adjustment. So here's with everything on it. Sounds cool, sounds interesting. About halfway through the song, uh, the percussions kind of kick in. And like I said, that was um, Edika, the singer and the guitarist. She played a little bell. Oh, it wasn't a bell, it was a triangle. They're playing a triangle. On this one, I used the Blue Stripe 1176. I use a de-esser and I cut, I think, about 7K. And then I use the vocal rider to kind of keep it down. Um, once again, not having it jump out. I did use the time adjustment again, which I'll bring up why I use the time adjustment. And then I wanted a, a low cut on it. And I really love the SSL EQ that's not the compressor. It's just an EQ from a channel strip. It's an old school one. I just love the way it cuts stuff. So I wanted to make room and make sure it wasn't too loud or big or bulky. And that's how I blend it. So those two together. Now we're getting to the guitaron, which is the bass that you pluck it and it's a beast to play. I don't think I could play one, but my friends do, and they rock it. So Dominique, who's the drummer and percussionist, is a multi-instrumental -in guy, and he can play that thing like it's no problem. Like the Beatles, we're doing the bass last. Um, Dominique, please explain what's going on, what's here, even the strings, and what kind of bass is that? Or is that a bass? It is a bass. It's probably one of the best acoustic basses um, made. I, I, in my opinion, I mean, I'm not a bass player though, I'm a drummer, but this is a mariachi instrument, it's called a guitarron, and it, you basically, traditionally, you play it doubled, double, like, so this would, so these top two strings are A and A, and you play it doubled, and it gives, it gives like the fat bass sound that, that you want, and then the, the body, you check that out, it's nice and robust. Also, I um, started working over the pandemic with my friend, Jacob, who has his company, GCS, Guadalupe Custom Strings, and I started making these strings also. So I didn't make these ones, but I did make these three. And I now know how to do all of it. Now, is there any difference between these three strings, the, the white ones and the red ones? Uh, these are um, steel core, like would go on a bass or a guitar. Mm -hmm. And these are nylon core. This is like a fiber. And, and then it's wrapped with a, another type of nylon. And, um, but kind of brings out the warmth in the, uh, the instrument. Cool. All right. Well, on the microphone side of things, I kind of want the sound pressure of the bass to be captured. So when you put up something like a barrier like this, it kind of keeps all the low end within this area. This is a Tascam, kind of a mini gobo for vocals. I use it for vocals, for guitars. And if I did a stand-up bass, I, I would use it for that. The microphone still, I have it 
It's still set for cardioid, so I haven't touched it since the initial percussions. And it's still set for M on the power supply, which is flat. And um, I'm aiming it kind of at the body of the guitar, but we're gonna we're gonna test it. If it sounds really good, we may stay with this. The only thing I may do is move this a little bit uh, lower. And beyond that, um, let's see what it sounds like. So on this one, we do have a lot of plugins. We have nine. So I'm gonna turn them all off. Usually when I do bass instruments of drums or bass guitars or a bass amp or a DI, if I'm reaching for something during a mix that I wanna make it sound cooler or just wanna carve out some frequencies or add them, my go-to is a Harrison. I love, it's a UA plugin. It's called a Harrison 32C or G EQ. It just makes me really happy. So when Dominique was here with me and we were working on this last night, I said, he mentioned he wanted some bass tones and wanted things to jump out. So I added the Harrison. So I'm gonna play it without the Harrison and then I'm gonna add it. So here's without. So you hear us plucking and there's just a little bit more detail. But once again, for this kind of music, it's not necessarily a bad thing, so I have a few things stick out. So my go-to on this was a LA 2 a which I always use, and then I kind of countered it with 1176. The LA 2 a is just a normal wave, and the um, 1176 is a bluey, it's a normal wave as well. So I'll play with the Harrison, and the two com uh, compressor limiters working kind of against themselves that give a little bit more movement to it, but also clamp it down and maybe have it sit better in the mix. If you notice when you heard that, there's a little kind of a zip sound. That was a little bit of feedback from his headphones. When we were doing it live in the moment, we were just like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. But as I listened to it later, I was like, holy smoke. So no one is perfect. I'm just being straight up and honest with you. Still sounds good. We'll figure it out. And then I put a de -esser. I'm cutting about 7K. And then, like I always mention, the R bass is one of my favorite, most musical plugins. It's a Renaissance bass, actually, and it's mu really musical. So I use it to add low M, but also I have it to kind of tame. If you heard him plucking, now that I've compressed it, it's really jumping out there. The R bass to me tames it, it sounds musical. It's almost like running it to a tape machine. So here's with the R bass on it. Now you're like, what is he doing? He's making it go down. But that's how I want it to fit into the mix. I don't want to be blasting too loud. When we get to our vocals, you'll see how Ethica sings, which is really beautiful and dynamic. And even though I wanted the music to be kind of pulsing around her, I don't want it to be too crazy or distracting. So then the next I added, one of my other favorites, is the vocal writer, which just saves me. I do some automation. I did do automation on her vocals. But when I use the vocal writer, it really saves me from really going through every track and doing automation. Just kind of tucks it in, and when I'm mixing, if something's too loud or too low, I just go, instead of to the fader, I go to the vocal writer and I adjust it. And I always know that my faders will be the same. And if I want to do any adjustments, I just go to the vocal writer. So as you can see, I'm building and subtracting and building and subtracting, but it's all I'm doing is just trying to get to the point where I really love what I'm hearing. And the most important thing is with the track. So if I sat there and I didn't hear anything else and I just carved that bass and did whatever, oh, that sounds great. 
it may not sell great in Czech. You really should. All these songs that I'm doing here, they started with no plugins. And then you just build them as you want to add things. Sometimes I don't use any plugins. This one, the band had a really specific idea and they wanted it to be, I mean, Ethica and Dominique had expressed that it would be sounding more like electronic or hip hop or something not as sounding as a traditional uh, acoustic instrument people playing around a microphone. That being said, that was the exciting part because then I had, you know, you know, just the gloves are off, let's have fun. So I did some different things like the delays and right here is called a time adjustment, one of my favorites. And I'll explain to you why almost everything has a time adjustment on it. Then after that, I added the forbidden tape delay. Dominique wanted uh, the bass to sit a certain way within the track. I thought blurring it with an analog tape delay was kind of cool. If you listen to Beach Boys or Carol Kay playing bass, they always did really cool stuff with like doubles and basses and sometimes a bass guitar being doubled with a guitar, which adds a little bit of thickness to it. So that's the delay. And then even more scary, another time delay. What are you thinking? the door is going to bust in and these guys are going to handcuff me and be like, you are breaking the law. But I did break the law and it's okay. So I'll explain to you later why that's there. Now we're going to get into the guitar. Ethica is playing guitar and usually she plays guitar and sings. But this one in particular, she did them different takes because we wanted to utilize the MA-37 and use it individually. So that's why... They are definitely a live vibe band, but we opted to be separate so we can really, there were good sports about it. So we can use the mic and test it and all these different things. So here's the acoustic guitar. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plugins on it. So now we've laid on a, a kind of the percussion template that Ethica is going to be playing over now. Um, I did have the microphone set on that adjustment to Omni when we did the percussions. But now I want to move it to Super Cardioid. So um, there's a small adjustments that you have in the capsule. I'm going to change it with a flathead screwdriver to Cardioid. All right. Even though it sounds crazy to be putting in a screwdriver to the back of the capsule, that's the way it's designed. And I believe the original ones were done like that. So there's a C and then a, a O for Omni, and then Cardioid. Those are really the only uh, polar patterns or changes that the microphone has. I want to capture the body of the guitar. So usually you would kind of put a mic around the 12th fret, aim it towards the, uh, the hole of the guitar. And we may do some adjustment inside, but that's kind of our starting point. And I didn't change anything on the microphone uh, power supply. It's still flat, uh, which is, I think the setting is M. And uh, the other ones are high-pass filters, but I'm not going to be messing with that. I just want flat recording. I want the tube sound of the power supply. I think it plays beautiful guitar. I want to try to capture the full body of the guitar. And um, we're only doing the guitars now over the bed of the drums that Dominique put down. All right, we're going to check it inside and make sure it sounds good, and we'll get going. So here's the acoustic flat. Sounds beautiful. And then I'm adding a tape delay to it. You know which one, the H delay. Barely. So it's like 1%, 2% on, but it just gives a little bit of movement to her playing. Then one of my favorite plugins is the Eddie Kramer EQ, which just makes everything sound great. So this is with the delay and the HLS EQ, which is like the Eddie Kramer EQ. So 
you can hear it do a little something, but I loved it. Then I add the 1176, which is kind of the taming, limiting, making it a little bit more aggressive, but not too much. Then I added a de-esser, which is subtracting. And this one, I am at about 6.5K. I'm taking a little bit down. I wanted to add a little bit more reverb that wasn't the typical. Uh, I always use the sound toys. And I wanted to use, it's called a PSP 2445 Digital rever re Reverberation. Um, I really, it's an EMT plate, basically. I love this one, so I put this on the guitar as well. Off. I love it because the mix is really killer where you can just kind of blend it in or not. But it's just, if you can imagine the guitar sitting here and I'm adding just a little bit of reflection behind it. And that's, maybe you won't hear it in the mix, but um, I just thought it made it sound rad. Then I put the vocal writer on it to tame it, like all the tracks that I feel like are kind of unleashed. This one on the guitar, I put a Helios EQ, a universal audio one. So let me play it without it and then I'll engage it. So I kind of went from point A, carved it out, asked the compression, and then I added just a little bit more detail to it. Even though I had the Kramer EQ on it, I just wanted something different. And the Helios was awesome. Then there's our notorious uh, time adjuster. I don't know what this guy's doing, but you'll see. All right, so now we're on to her main vocals. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine plugins on that. I'm gonna turn them all off. On her vocals, we are doing something a little bit different. I'm summing the vocals to a auxiliary that has a delay, an EQ, a de and a little bit of time adjustment because we wanted a little bit of something on a voice that wasn't a plug-in on it, something left and right. And then I have another auxiliary, and I don't know if you can see this, but it's an Audioscape. It's called an XL305R. And this is a hardware piece of gear and it's made from a classic that was about maybe 30, 40 years ago. I'm trying this out, and a buddy of mine that had an original one just tested this and loved it. So I asked him if I can borrow it, and Audioscape was nice enough to let, permit me to use it on this mix. So this is the only thing coming outside into hardware will be her vocals bust of this, and I'll play what this sounds like in a second. But just to let you know, there is like six springs in here that are tuned. You have inputs for the for the sound coming in. Then you have a mix level, kind of like the way I use the um, plate. And then you have this really cool assortment of EQ where I'm cutting the low end, not really touching the middle. And then the high end, I kind of tucked it back a little bit. It just sounds so beautiful. So I'll play your vocals dry, and then I'll show you what I'm running through. And that's just coming back into an aux here. But if you didn't have this unit, any Abbey Road reverb, anything like that. and But I really will just stress that a spring reverb like this is just incredible. And a lot of mastering cats from the 70s, this is their little secret weapon. When they would be mastering a record, you had a little verb in it, and suddenly it's like, wow, it sounds beautiful, but would have been that guy. So Audioscape, they did it right. And I've already tested this a few times. It's just smoking cool. So I'm... Once again, her voice is going to love that. So this is her voice without that and dry. Find out that you're not you And I'm not me You can hear a little something around that. You know, when we cut that in the day, I do, even though I'm a producer, my studio is located in a war zone. It's in the middle of like 400 musicians. There's hundreds of rooms around here that bands play. And 
I've learned to work around that a little bit. So even though you may hear a little bit of air around there and you could be like, why is it there? I just flow with it and I've learned how to work with it. So you will hear a little bit of sound around her. But as we EQ it and put her in the mix and add the reverb, it's just a little cool something. So here's the vocals with some delay. API EQ added. I added some top end. I cut a little bit low. I did 1176 and an LA-2A and then a de I think it's 3500. I cut a little bit on that. A vocal writer to tame it. And then I used a Fairchild. And the reason I added it even after I did the 1176, because I got her voice to sit well, but I felt like as she moved through the song and she got more passionate and got louder, it was really hard to control that, even though I automated it. So I wanted to use the Fairchild kind of like a tape machine. If you don't know what that means, um, it's not a big deal. But in the old days when I had a tape machine, I had a loud vocal, a loud solo. Tape would sometimes absorb that loud sound in a really beautiful way. So I try to use the compressor like when I had my tape machine, and you could just force something loud into the audio, and the music seemed to buckle up with it, but it never sounded too loud. So I used it in that sense, kind of like it was a tape machine. Then I added some delay, another delay on her, just to kind of space it out some more. When Ethica talked about her vocals, she just said, I want it to sound really cool. It doesn't have to be just a voice. She embraced kind of some reverbs and effects, which brought us to why I even use the uh, hardware uh, spring rever reverb on her vocals. And then I did some time adjustments, some more legal stuff, some CIA secret stuff. I'll tell you about it. So here's her vocals um, with everything on it. And then um, I'll add the reverb and the sends, which I used on the mix. Find out that you're not you And I'm not me Okay, so now on the master bus, I put a reverb. And I know, once again, people say don't do that. We were all sitting here. It sounded beautiful, and I went with it. So here's the reverb on the master channel. Don't do that, but do that. Find out that you're not you. And I'm not me. So after we did that vocal, I made an, another auxiliary, and I put her vocals and some things into it. On this auxiliary, she wanted a little bit more of a wider, cool sound, and I use the can put some kind of weird thing, but I just kind of stuck to the basics. So I put another delay on it. I cranked it all the way to wet, not dry. I time delayed it, so it was a little bit, little bit behind her vocal. And then I added an EQ, which I'm cutting the low end and the top end. Now that's something that a lot of old school mastering guys and producers would do to reverb plates and spring reverbs. And it just kills that kind of high end thing or that low end rumble. So that's why I'm using the CQ on the auxiliary off of vocals, and I'll play you with that on. Find out that you're not you, and I'm not me, but a mere vessel. Oh. All right, so now I have the auxiliary with some vocals in it. A little ruckus -y, but it is what it is. Now, this is where I added the hardware. I have another send with the hardware on it. On this send, I have one, two, three, four, five plugins. I put a Universal Audio 1176 on it because I just, it sounds different than the waves. Better, worse, it doesn't matter. I just wanted something different because I have used a lot of Wave 1176s. I just wanted for, I put a lot of input and medium output. The attack is about halfway, and then the uh, release is all the way over. I'm just using this kind of as a boost, but then also a little bit to tame it. Then I put an EQ, which I did the same one that I used on the other aux early, which is cutting all the low end off, adding top end. Yes, sir, of course, 
What am I cutting on this one? 2K, a little bit. Vocal writer, because like her vocals coming through her main track, if she screams or does something really loud into the reverb, I just wanted a little bit more control on it. So that's why I have my favorite vocal writer. It's kind of like my enforcer of just not having to be everywhere and everything and trying to tame everything. It's a nice little cap on those things. And um, time adjustment, even though it's already set back by running through there, running through this, coming back, running through the delay, I just wanted a little bit more decay. And the time adjustment just gives you that long sweep. So now here's her vocals with the hardware on and the auxiliary that has the delay. Find out that you're not you And I'm not me But a mere vessel of carrying us So you, I just cranked it so you can hear what that's doing, but it's really beautiful. It's very glassy, really clean. There's not a lot of rumble in it, and um, I love it. So that was the last of the audio tracks, and the only thing I did that was a little bit outside in the production of the song is on this channel, which I do have it being summed to the crazy delay. I got the first line of the song, I reversed it. In Pro Tools, there's a, uh, I'm sure whatever DAW you have, there's something. So I go to Auto Suites, I go to Other, and I go down to Reverse. And you can get whatever you've highlighted and just reverse it or invert it. Um, you can even do that with like an overhead. You want, a, not reverse it, but you can invert it, do all these things. So once it was reversed, obviously her last word is her first word. So I cut it up, even though you can't tell what she's saying, and I tried to cut it up so that it was kind of a nice musical accident. So the first time I reversed it, dropped it in, eyeballed it where it was at, played it for them, and they loved it. And then I went back in and then kind of cut it up so it matched better with her vocals. So if you can tell here, it's her first word, and it kind of sweeps up backwards, which would have been her last word over her first word. And then as she's singing, it seemed to have just timed well. Only towards the middle, I've cut a few of the lines just so it sounded like it wasn't so just blasting backwards. So here is the backwards vocal by itself, and then I'll play it with the main vocal. So you get the idea, it's a little spooky. But when you put it in with her voice, and this is just, I'm not saying it, I just lucked out that the first time I dropped it in, it matched up pretty well, except for the few little cuts I did to just give it a little bit of break every now and then. So here's the vocal with the spooky backup vocal only on the first lines of the song. Find out that you're not you. And I'm not me, but a mere vessel of carrying us through. All right, so that's cool for me, and it was cool for them. Um, now I'll play the track the way it's printed with all the whistles and bells. And there is one little intro thing that they really loved. When she was doing her um, triangle, I think she just did a few tests before I said, oh, yeah, we're going to record, and she did a noise. We thought it was cool, so we kept it in the beginning. 
So you're gonna hear it start off with a little triangle and then the track starts. You hear the vocals, you got the backward vocals, which were kind of the production thing we added. And then after that, after I play this, I'll discuss why we have some time adjustments on everything. That sounds really pretty. And um, so now I'll just the last thing I'll talk about, I do have all these time adjustments. Because I did everything separate, I think I'm a little sensitive to how I want things to kind of gel. I love live performances. And nothing against them because they were really good sports to let us do the one mic on everything. There was a little bit of a disconnection that I felt from the glue that they usually have when they play live together. So one of the things I rely on sometimes when a bass player plays with a drummer, and you would really kind of want the bass player to be sometimes ahead, but most time kind of behind. And I'm, you know, I make the expression of giving that guy like an audio joint and just put him back a little bit. Um, Hip hop records, dance, and modern records. If you hear anything on the radio, I feel they slip stuff back to make it sound interesting and cool. So because the band was completely open to adding sounds and the reverbs, I went through every track and played them all together. And then I just used these different time adjustments to slip someone back. Maybe the bass a little bit more. Maybe the guitar was just a hair. Maybe Etika was just back a little bit. And when you put it together, it was this really nice kind of glued movement of the band. And when I had it without it, I just felt like it needed something. So if you find yourself and the band is accepting and they let you have fun, you can play God a little bit and move a few people back. I don't recommend it. It's only on certain songs that it really works. But if you have a punk band playing and the bass player is just totally ahead, you can use a time adjustment to slip him back a hair and then you'll be shocked on how good he sounds with the drums. Or a guitar player that always play, play ahead of the band. I wish I could tell you the famous band, but I'd get in trouble if I told you. But I know they did a famous record, sold a lot of records. The producer ran the guitar player into an SPX90 and slipped him back because he was always ahead. And that record sold millions. So a, even in the 80s and the 90s, people were still fooling around with that. And it's something because I'm old school in the sense of where I come from, that doesn't feel that bad to do that. So uh, you'll hear the whole track of them playing together. And... Um, I just had those little time adjustments to relax them and make them play more together. And they were not so rigid playing to the click or playing to the beat and as, as they layered their channels and tracks, um, it felt better. So that was it. That's one mic, one band. Thanks to Dominique and Edika and Warren and Producer like Pro and Mojave for making a kick-ass mic. That's all I got today. Thank you. <laughs>